Hello, everybody. Um, my name is James Blair. And uh, before I talk to you about Zool, uh, first I want to show you a little bit of ANSI art. Uh, I work for Red Hat. Uh, I'm on the OpenStack project infrastructure team. I'm particularly focused on the CI system, uh, which runs a program that we wrote called Zool, the next version of which is based heavily on Ansible. So with that out of the way, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, we're, what I'm going to say today. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a bit about the current version of Zool, which is at version 2. That's what we're running in production right now um, for, the, uh, for the OpenStack project. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the next version, which is in development. Uh, we call that version 3, and, uh, and give you a preview of some of the features that we're adding to that and uh, some of the differences between uh, version 2 and version 3. So who here, by a, a show of hands, uh, has submitted a patch to an OpenStack project? OK. And uh, who would like to in the future? OK. <laughs> I know that's an ambiguous question. Some of the people who raised their hands the first time did not raise their hands the second time. <laughs> okay, that's 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 helpful. Um, so uh, if if you've uh, if you've submitted a patch before, you might have seen this in in action. Um, uh, and also, if you uh, saw the keynote yesterday, um, uh, then you probably know some of this as well. But at uh, at OpenStack scale, uh, our CI system is huge. We have 1,500 Git repositories. We launch um, at peak more than 200 jobs per hour. Uh, over the course of a month, we merge 10,000 changes across those repositories. And our CI system uh, runs in 20 regions across uh, nine different clouds. Uh, at least I think that's still the case, because I don't think we've quite reverted the patch that Jonathan Bryce pushed up yesterday. So uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're a developer, you've seen this before. Um, actually, you may not have seen this before. But when you, when you submit a patch to, to Garrett, um, uh, uh, there's, a, uh, there's, there's an interface. Uh, it looks like this for me. Um, but um, most other developers use the web interface, so it actually looks like this. And um, uh, this, is, this is actually the the primary interface to Zool that we want developers to see. We actually want Zool to stay out of the way, to sit in the background and serve developers and not, not be all, hey, I'm Zool, look at me. Um, so when a developer submits a patch, they can, uh, and when reviewers go to review that patch, they see a page that looks like this, uh, where, uh, where you have your commit message. Uh, down and off the bottom of the screen is uh, our, our review messages from, from reviewers. But if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, there's a little thing that has uh, the jobs that ran on that change and, um, and their status. And uh, those are actually hyperlinks that go to, um, uh, that show you the logs for those, those jobs. Um, but that's all we really want users to see most of the time. And uh, I, I realize that that doesn't, you know, that doesn't look uh, super cool and whatnot, but, um, but like I said, we, 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 we're here to serve. Um, having said that, however, there actually is a lot going on in the background. And uh, uh, Jonathan brought this up on stage at the keynote yesterday. You might have uh, seen it. So this is, this is the Zool status page. It shows you all of the jobs that are running in all of the different configurations for all of the changes that are in flight, um, uh, how much time is left on that sort of thing. So you can see there's, there's actually quite a bit going on in the background. Um, this is, if you zoom out a little bit, it, it looks like this because as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's a really busy system. Um, and I couldn't even fit it all on that page, so it still goes off the bottom. Um, we also have uh, a, a complementary program uh, called OpenStack Health, uh, which lets you deep dive into the results of jobs that Zool has run. Uh, so we actually have a lot of different ways of exposing this data to users uh, and developers if they want to uh, dive into it. Um, but like I said, generally we try to stay as out of the way as possible. Um, this is uh, a diagram of, of Zool's architecture. Um, so you have an idea of what I'm, some of the parts I'm going to talk about in, that in a little bit. But um, uh, as mentioned earlier, a developer uh, who's typing on 
a computer that has an eerie green screen, um, sends, uh, sends a patch up to Garrett. Zool listens to Garrett on an event stream and responds to various events as it's configured to do um, based on, on users pushing up changes or reviewing changes and, and, and things like that. Um, Zool is a distributed system with a number of different components. So once it gets a change from Garrett, uh, it asks its, uh, its merger to uh, pull that change down and collect some information about it. Uh, in OpenStack, we run eight different Zool mergers, uh, and those are basically servers that sit there all day, every day, doing nothing but performing Git operations. Um, they, they keep pretty busy. Um, so once Zool finds out what it needs to about the change from the merger, it, uh, it, it, at that point it knows what, job it needs, what jobs it needs to run. Uh, and those jobs have certain requirements as to what nodes they might need to run on. Uh, so it talks to, to node pool, which is the, uh, the, the, our component which talks to those 20 different clouds across, uh, sorry, 20 regions across nine clouds. Um, it, spins up OpenStack instances to run those jobs, uh, and then it hands those instances over to uh, a component uh, called the Zool Launcher, um, which, uh, which, is, which runs Ansible, and uh, Ansible uh, connects to the nodes that were provided by NodePool and actually runs uh, the jobs. Um, so NodePool is worth talking about just a minute, because I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about Zool, but NodePool is, is a separate program that works very closely with Zool. Um, uh, we, it has a different name, but we kind of consider it part of the same suite of programs. They're, they're very tightly integrated. Um, it, in addition to spinning up nodes, like I just described, it also, uh, once a day, it builds new base images and uploads to all the different, uh, uploads that to all the different clouds. That's something that, that you, you know, a smaller CI system may not need to do. You might just be able to use your, your upstream image provided by your uh, cloud provider or your distribution. Uh, since we're running across so many different clouds, uh, the, the little differences between those base images make a big difference to us. Uh, so we normalize that by building our own in images, uh, we also go ahead and cache a bunch of things that we're going to need for our jobs on those images, and we upload them uh, every day to all of the clouds so that uh, they behave consistently. And um, uh, this system exercises OpenStack very heavily. Uh, if you remember that 2,000 jobs per hour number, since each of our jobs runs on a VM that is created just for that job and then destroyed, we are across those different clouds creating and destroying 2,000 OpenStack virtual machines uh, every hour. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite a useful stress test for, for OpenStack. Um, it's also useful to know a, a couple of uh, definitions of a couple of words that I'm going to uh, use as we go on. Uh, the first is gating. Um, gating is very central to what Zool does. It's actually the, the reason that we created it in the first place. And it's a very simple idea. It's the idea that a change, every change that's proposed to a, a repository is tested and it must pass those tests before it merges. Um, Cogating is, uh, is a variation on that, where if you imagine that you have more than one repository uh, that are related, then you make sure that uh, the tests to, uh, sorry, the changes to each of those repositories are tested against the state of the other repository before each one merges, essentially so that they can't break each other. And you can imagine in, in a world where you're building up uh, complicated uh, services out of microservices, or even in OpenStack's case, macro services, um, that being able to make sure that one of those services doesn't break another one or the whole could be uh, a very useful thing. Um, and then finally, uh, parallel code gating is actually what, uh, what Zool does at this point in time. And that's if, if you if you imagine what I just said about co-gating, where you're saying, I'm going to land a change to this project and land a change to another project, and I don't want them to break each other, uh, you might implement that by just testing them one at a time uh, in series. That's, that's very easy to do, and it's very correct, uh, but it's also very slow. And uh, there's no way we could land the, the change volume that we do if we did it that way. So what Zool does is it creates uh, speculative future states uh, with a bunch of changes together, uh, uh, test them all with the assumption that they're all going to pass, and if anything changes, it rearranges things as needed uh, to make sure that they, uh, 
uh, they can merge. So we can actually get a very high throughput of changes merging by running all these tests in, in parallel. Um, so I'm actually sort of a visual person. So if that explanation sort of made you very confused, um, or, or the fact that the way that I rambled on about it made it confusing, um, then I have this little uh, visual illustra illustration of the process uh, that can hopefully help you walk through it. So if you imagine that we have two projects, uh, let's call them Nova and Keystone, and, uh, and uh, they have two Git repositories, and up there on the screen there are two yellow dots uh, with some funny uh, hexadecimal words next to them. Uh, those are the branch tips of those two repositories. So a developer might come along and approve a change to Nova. Uh, Zool notices that and, and queues it into, uh, into its pipeline. Um, and then it starts running jobs for that change. Then another developer comes along and, uh, and uploads uh, a change, sorry, approves a change to the Keystone project. And uh, Zool starts running uh, jobs for those changes. Um, and then, uh, say, a developer approves two more changes to the Nova project. At this point, we've got four changes in Zool's queue. Uh, jobs are starting to run on all of them. Um, I'm sorry, the, the blue is a little hard to see there. But, uh, but it's meant to illustrate the, uh, the, the job run time as, uh, as this goes on. So the thing to know about this, this series of changes up here is that the first change, that Nova number one, is being tested against the, the tip of the Nova repository. Uh, the second change is being tested uh, against the tip of the Keystone repository, but in any integration tests that involve both Nova and Keystone, uh, it's also including the change ahead of it, that number one change. And by the time you get down to the bottom of the screen, uh, Nova number four is running with all four of those changes in place. So then uh, something terrible happens, and one of the jobs uh, on that Keystone change fails. At that point, the, the future state that Zool has created in order to test changes three and four is no longer valid. We know that since we don't allow any change to merge if it fails its tests, that Keystone number two is not going to merge. And so uh, Nova three and Nova four are being tested with a change that isn't valid anymore. Uh, so Zool cancels the jobs that are running for that change. Uh, it sort of moves the Keystone change off to the side uh, because we want to keep running the jobs for that so that we can report back as much information as possible to a developer. But then Zool reparents uh, changes three and four on top of change number one and restarts their jobs. So these are now uh, running only with the changes that could possibly land ahead of it. Uh, those, uh, those jobs can continue. The, the jobs for that first change finish. Uh, they succeed, and so we merge number one into the Nova Git repository. Uh, the rest of the jobs for Keystone uh, finish, and uh, at this point, we're ready to report back to the developer that uh, this change failed its tests, so it didn't merge, uh, but here are all the results. You can go look at it. Uh, and then changes number three and number four finish up and merge. So you can imagine that, uh, so, so this is, this is a, a series of changes that were uh, in queued in Zool in sort of an arbitrary order, just by the happenstance of how people, when people approved certain changes. Um, Zool also gives us the ability to control this deliberately. So we can actually create a series of changes and tell Zool that they depend on each other, and Zool will enqueue them in that order uh, so that they're all tested appropriately. So if you imagine making a change um, to an OpenStack project, say um, you want to add a change to Nova that, that returns the SSH host keys in the instance metadata. I think that would be a great change. What do you think, Monty? <laughs> Um, so, so if you implement that change in Nova, um, that's really just the, the, the start of the process. Um, then perhaps in order for that change to take effect, you might need to con uh, configure DevStack to turn that feature on uh, with a feature flag or something. I don't know why, because it should be the default, but let's say you have to do that. Um, so then you write a change to DevStack, and, and you say that this change depends on the change that I just wrote to Nova. That means that when DevStack runs its tests against this change that you just wrote to DevStack, it will pull in your change to Nova and run with it. 
after that, you might need to write a change to Nova client to actually expose this uh, in the Python API. You can say that depends on the dev stack change. So then when Nova client interacts with uh, a running dev stack Nova instance, it's able to actually uh, fetch that data. Um, and let's say that your ultimate goal is to add this to node pool. Well, node pool uses the, the shade library. And so uh, you might need to add support to this to shade. And you say, well, shade uses Nova client to get this information. So this shade chain, this shade change depends on the Nova client change. And then finally in node pool, you can say my node pool change depends on the shade change. And when that test, uh, when the jobs for, for this node pool change runs, uh, they will contain all of the changes ahead of it. Uh, and you can test this entire process from end to end, from, from uh, the exposing the feature in Nova to using it as an end user in NodePool. And you can do that all in our CI system without landing a change to any of these repositories. So you can go to all of the developers of all of those different projects and say, look, this thing works end to end, uh, let's land it. Uh, and that's a very powerful feature that, uh, that Zool provides. <laughs> So one of the things that we've wanted to do in Zool for a while, because I mean, I've, I've, I've been spending uh, quite some time talking about all these tests we run. And, uh, and it turns out that when we change Zool's configuration itself, it's, uh, it's surprisingly untestable at the moment. I mean, we run a lot of tests that validate the configuration syntax, uh, make sure that you don't do anything silly and you have the appropriate amount of white space. But we, what we can't do is in some cases is say, well, I wanna actually run this code in a job and make sure it works before we land it. Sometimes we just have to say, yep, that looks right and land it and, and exercise it. So um, in, in the height of irony, our CI system itself is not as CI'd as we would like it to be. Uh, so in Zool v3, we're working on a, a, a feature um, uh, to allow Zool to process configuration changes to itself uh, live on the fly. And uh, the way we do that is kind of interesting. Uh, when Zool starts up, it has almost no configuration whatsoever. Uh, this is essentially what a Zool bootstrapping configuration file will look like in v3. Um, we say that we have a tenant called OpenStack because Zool v3 is, is multi-tenant aware. Um, it, it talks to a Garrett. It has um, it, you can find its configuration in a, in a Git repository called project config, uh, which is uh, the, the repository where we, we have all of our jobs defined right now centrally. Um, but also uh, there are a bunch of projects that are basically the, 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 Git, reposi re the Git repositories that Zool itself is working on. Uh, for instance, Nova, Keystone, DevSat Gate, et cetera. We have 1,500 other of those. Um, and Zool will actually pull its configuration from all of these repositories. The reason why there's a config repository and project repository differences, there are, there are some things that we still only want to be able to, uh, uh, to manage uh, centrally, but uh, like for instance, uh, jobs that require uh, authentication credentials or, or something like that. We, we can't have somebody uploading a job that says, hey, print out the uh, authentication credentials. Uh, so there is actually a little difference between the, the config and project repositories. But Zool in general, uh, in, in most cases, will be able to pull its configuration from any repository listed in, a, in this config. So when Zool starts up, um, it, it loads that up, loads that config file. And then it talks to those, uh, those mergers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, as I said, we have eight of them. So in our system, it's, it's going to say, hey, mergers, um, go to all these repositories and get me a list of all of the branches in all of those repositories. They'll go churn on Git operations for a while, return that list back. And then Zool says, okay, mergers, go to every branch of every repository and look for a zool.yaml file and return that to me. And so uh, as Zool starts up, it goes from having no configuration whatsoever to having this fleet of distributed workers go and collect its configuration from thousands of different places, return it back to Zool, where it assembles it into uh, something that uh, a holistic whole configuration that, uh, that it can apply to the whole system. And uh, because of the way that runs, and of course, because Zool is seeing every change that goes through the system, uh, whenever there's a change to a Zool.yaml file, um, Zool can go back out to the mergers and say, hey, look, there's a change. To, um, it might be changing my configuration. So go get that content for me. Um, it then 
takes the, what it gets back from the Zool merger, splices it into the running configuration that it uses just for that change, uh, and, and uses it to decide what jobs to run and how to run them for the change. Uh, and uh, because this is implemented just with the regular Zool primitives, this works with cross-repo dependencies too. So you can have a change in a project that depends on a change to Zool's configuration in another project. So uh, with, hmm, yes. I'm sorry? Um, uh, I will, right now, I hope, uh, probably, but uh, I hope we'll have enough testing that you won't be able to break uh, Zool that way. <laughs> uh, so yeah, part of, part of the, the project config uh, um, uh, and repo config split is to make sure that things that are very dangerous uh, uh, don't necessarily uh, break Zool this way. Um, uh, and of course, if your change to Zool.yaml fails, then, uh, like if Zool can't even parse it, then, well, that change is going to fail its tests. And so it's essentially being CI'd in the normal way. So, uh, so with that background information, uh, I think it might be a little useful to show you some of, uh, some more of Zool's configuration. Zool is a very free form system. Um, uh, we have a lot of concepts in how we've defined OpenStack's workflow that are, um, that are not understood by Zool natively. We've built them out of very simple configuration primitives. Uh, and so with just a few, knowledge of a few of these, you can, you can build very, uh, very sophisticated systems. Uh, so the first primitive is uh, what we call a pipeline. And that's essentially a process definition that connects up Git, repo Git repositories, jobs, and triggering and reporting mechanisms. Um, they're basically the same in V2 and V3, so if you've done anything with Zool in V2, that's not going to change a lot between uh, 2 and 3. Uh, so in, in OpenStack, we have uh, something that we call uh, a check pipeline, and that's the, the pipeline that runs jobs on a change when somebody uploads them uh, for the first time. Um, and so this is a simplified view of what that configuration looks like for us. Um, we basically say that this pipeline looks for um, triggering events from Garrett. Uh, patch set created is what it emits when somebody uploads a new patch set. Uh, change restored is when somebody restores an abandoned change. There are a few other things we listen to, uh, but I've omitted them for, for brevity here. Uh, but basically a pipeline is a free form thing where you say something, something triggers in queuing into this pipeline. Uh, when we run jobs, we report back uh, via several, one of well, any number of mechanisms. Um, and so down here at the bottom, what we say is when jobs succeed in this pipeline, report back to Garrett with a verified plus one vote. Um, we could also send email, report to a database, uh, throw something into IRC, or, or nothing at all, in fact. Um, we have uh, also something that we call in OpenStack the gate pipeline. This is, this is the thing that actually prevents changes from landing unless they've passed tests. Um, uh, there's a subtle difference between this one and the check pipeline. It says manager dependent. Uh, check pipeline says manager independent. That triggers that, that behavior change that causes things to be enqueued one after the other. Um, uh, again, we're looking for things from Garrett, except this time we're looking for, for a comment event uh, for somebody saying that they've uh, uh, approved this change with a workflow vote. Uh, and then if changes uh, pass their tests, report back to Garrified with a plus two vote in the verified column and uh, submit the change. Submit is Garrett speak for, uh, for merge the change. And that's how, that's how that magic happens. Uh, once you've got some pipelines defined, you might want to uh, configure some jobs. Jobs, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they run on nodes from node pool. Uh, right now, all of our nodes are dynamic, uh, but in V3, you're going to be able to, to check out static nodes from node pool as well uh, and run jobs on them. Uh, the metadata for jobs are all defined in Zool's configuration. So that's things like how long the job runs, when it should run, uh, what kind of nodes it needs to run on, things like that. But the actual execution content of the jobs is defined in Ansible because you know, we did not need to invent another way of describing how to run things on remote hosts. There's, uh, there's a great tool out there that does that already uh, called Ansible, so we decided to use that. Um, 
jobs can be defined centrally, uh, like in the project config repo, uh, or in the repository being tested, uh, uh, as well as their, their execution content. Um, and then in V3, uh, the configuration syntax is, is a lot more flexible. Uh, we have contextual variants of jobs that, that can run uh, jobs with slightly different parameters based on different, uh, different conditions. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Um, Jobs also have an inheritance structure. So you, can, uh, you might start off by writing a job uh, and where you set up some sensible defaults for your whole system. Uh, so this is a job called base, which has a 30 minute timeout. It runs on an Ubuntu Zenial node, a single Ubuntu Zenial node. Uh, it, it's going to, when Zool prepares all of the Git repositories that it needs for whatever, uh, whatever might be involved for this change, uh, put them in a place called opt workspace. And before you run the playbook for this job, run a setup host playbook. That might do some things like um, set up local configuration for the job that's needed for CI. Uh, uh, and then post run is you know, uh, what to run after you've completed running the job. Uh, so once you've defined your base job, uh, your typical job might actually be very simple. You might simply say, there's a job called Python 2.7. Uh, and it inherits from, from that base job. And then Zool will know to look for a playbook called Python 2.7, and, and that's what it'll run for the job. Um, a variant on that job might be to say, well, if you're going to run the Python 2.7 job and it's on a change to the stable Mataka branch, um, use a trusty node for that instead of the Zenial node. Um, if you need to run a job that requires more than one node, then uh, you might have a definition that looks like this, uh, where instead of saying your node is Ubuntu Zenial, you uh, list out your nodes and you say that I need a node called controller and it should be an Ubuntu Zenial node. And then I need a second Zenial node called compute. And uh, then what Zool will do is it will take both of these nodes, drop them into the Ansible uh, inventory file with those names. And so you can refer to those nodes by name in your Ansible playbook. Once you have uh, jobs defined, then, uh, then you're going to want to, uh, jobs and pipelines defined, then you're going to want to have uh, some projects defined which hook those jobs up into those pipelines. Um, so a, a simple, version of the Nova project might look like this, where you say this is a, this is a project whose name is Nova, um, and for any changes that match the, uh, the requirements for entering the check queue, uh, then uh, run the Python 2.7, Python 3.5, and the docs jobs. Um, and those would, of course, be jobs that you've defined previously. Uh, in the same way that you can have job variants in the configuration file generally, you can also have project local job variants here. So uh, here we're saying, in addition to those three jobs I said before, also run the PyPy job, except on Nova, PyPy isn't voting. So, uh, so run it as you normally would, but don't, don't vote. Um, another slightly more complicated variant might say only run the docs job if somebody changes files in the docs directory. That's actually a terrible idea, never do that, uh, but the reason for that is complicated. Um, uh, but but this, this sort of thing is, is very, uh, very flexible and, and, and there are sensible rules that you might want to set up uh, to run jobs in, under certain conditions. Um, and uh, here's another example of a variant where we're saying, um, no matter what, we're going to run a Python 2.7 job. Um, normally run it on a Zenial node, but if you're running on stable Newton, run on an Ubuntu trusty node, just for Nova. Um, I don't even know if that makes sense, but uh, that's the sort of thing that you can do with, uh, with, uh, with local variants. Uh, and then of course, um, jobs can have dependencies on each other. So here we're saying uh, in the release pipeline, which is something that we run when somebody uh, tags a repository, build a tarball for that repository, upload it to, uh, to our tarballs and, and PyPy site, and, and if that succeeds, um, update our local mirrors. And so these jobs only run if the job before it succeeded. So you can build up this pipeline of jobs uh, this way. Um, and then finally, the actual, as I mentioned, the actual execution content of jobs is specified in playbooks. Uh, playbooks can be defined centrally or in the repository being tested. 
Um, they can use playbooks, uh, sorry, they can use roles from other projects inside of Zool or roles out from the galaxy. Um, uh, and we actually, we actually expect our playbooks to be uh, very heavily uh, role-based. Uh, for instance, a simplified view of the playbook that we, run f that we use for running our dev stack uh, and Tempest tests looks, might look sort of like this, where we say that um, first set up the multi-node networking uh, for, uh, for the node that we're running on, partition the swap, uh, configure the mirrors, then run dev stack, then run Tempest. And then all of these roles uh, can actually be defined in other repositories and they can be used uh, in many different projects, not just the projects that we're, uh, that we're using them in today. So uh, in fact, a lot of projects in, in OpenStack are running tests on our dev stack nodes. Uh, they're using dev stack to set up the environment, essentially just to get uh, some of the side effects from, from how we set up that test. So by decomposing this monolithic job that we have today into multiple roles uh, and then having them available for any other project to use uh, um, will make uh, the configuration of all of these projects a lot simpler uh, and, and uh, allow for reuse across them in a way that, that we're not able to do today. Um, so if, of course, you're you know, perhaps you're, you know, you're not into, uh, you don't need all of the advanced features of Ansible. You're not, um, there's a lot that you can do with Ansible in Zool, but maybe you just need to write a job that runs a shell script. Um, it's a pretty common pattern in a CI system. You can do that too. Ansible, of course, is perfectly capable of running some shell. Uh, and so a, a playbook that, that just runs your run test script uh, would look like this. And so if you need Ansible to get out of the way, uh, it can. But uh, the thing that we, that we really like uh, about this system is that uh, it lets you use the full power of Ansible in uh, not only in your production system, but in your development system and your CI system as well. And if you write your playbooks well, you'll be able to use the same playbooks in both places. Um, you can use your production playbooks to run your CI testing uh, you'll just provide, Zool will provide them with different variables files, different inventory files, and, uh, and magic will happen. Um, so with that, uh, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, the question is, could you could you swap Ansible uh, for some other uh, system like Puppet or or Chef? Uh, but you also said private cloud, so I'm, uh, I may not fully understand. I've got a little, uh, you know, testing some other changes that I uh, that I'd like to have in my private cloud. Mm -hmm. Could I swap some other mechanisms there, like an API interface to that? Um, so uh, we're we're basing this version pretty heavily on Ansible. Uh, we're not. We're not looking at having, um, having uh, a facility to swap out some other mechanism for running. It's theoretically possible. I mean, you know, there's at some point you're handing something off to another component and, and it could run. Uh, but uh, in, in OpenStack, we actually, we of course, there are OpenStack projects that use Ansible for deployment, but there are also OpenStack projects that use Puppet and Chef and, and whatnot for deployment. And we're going to run the jobs for those with the system as well. Um, there, whether it ends up looking, uh, looking like this, where it's, you know, there's an Ansible playbook that just says run Chef or run Puppet, um, that's of course an option. There is in fact an Ansible module for running Puppet that we wrote and uh, we use in our infrastructure because we actually use Puppet to manage the OpenStack infrastructure itself. Um, uh, there's an Ansible module that's really good at running Puppet, and so you might end up, probably what we will do, in fact, is end up writing playbooks that say, use the Ansible Puppet module to run Puppet, uh, and we'll actually have some really good integration there. Yes? Um, just curious, are you planning or, pl yeah, are you planning to basically have an eventing system that isn't Garrett-based, so I can trigger things that aren't coming from Garrett but are coming from some other random location? Yes, absolutely. Um, the probably the first one. So we're we're going to make that uh, an extension point, uh, and uh, there will be like a nice API there, uh, so it'll be easy to to uh, 
uh, to add new triggering and reporting mechanisms. The first one that we're going to add is probably going to be for GitHub because we'd like to run this CI system for the Ansible project itself and they use GitHub. Um, uh, um, we'll also probably, we're actually looking forward to using it in OpenStack as well, because sometimes we have dependencies in OpenStack on projects out there in GitHub, and we would love to be able to say, this patch depends on a change that's uh, a pull request in GitHub. And the, interac the, the, the intersection between those two systems, I think, is going to be really cool. Yeah, yeah, so the, the, um, the, the triggering system is actually separate from the, uh, from, the, the, from the source system. So there need to be Git repositories involved at some point at this, at this time, but the triggering doesn't have to come from where the Git repositories is. So, so where it says source Garrett, um, that's actually, uh, uh, I glossed over this because they're the same here, but um, source Garrett is saying, Get the get the Git repositories from Garrett. Trigger Garrett is saying get the events from Garrett. So you could say source Garrett and then trigger uh, some RPM build happen somewhere. With the Ansible runs, how does the console output link back to the publishers? Um, so. Uh, in in the current version of Zool, uh, we've been working on uh, on on. We've, we've sort of been trying out some ways of getting that, that information back. Um, Monty Taylor has, uh, has written a really cool um, uh, Ansible uh, plugin that basically substitutes for the Ansible command module and captures the, the standard output and, uh, and it goes into a log file that, uh, that, that can be streamed in real time by users. So you'll have that sort of, that you'll be able to have the, the sort of um, real-time streaming log file that you're used to in CI systems um, without having to change your playbooks at all. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, cool. Anything else? All right, thank you all very much.